Good morning. Sorry for the, the late start. Welcome to the Maryland Public Service Commission's administrative meeting. We have minutes to approve from the February 26, 2020 meeting. All in favor? Aye. The minutes are approved. Mr. Secretary, the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are originally three items on today's consent agenda. However, there have been some changes based on uh, a late filing uh, item number one. We're going to move to the administrative agenda. Uh, and then for item number three, based on uh, some late filed information, that will be deferred to a future admin uh, and staff will coordinate with the commission on rescheduling that. Uh, that leaves just one item on today's consent agenda, uh, item number two, uh, which is an application from WATTB Inc. for a license to supply electricity or electric generation services in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Do commissioners have questions on item number two? Seeing none, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I move that we grant the company a license to operate as an electricity supplier in Maryland, limited to broker services for the customer classes and service territories applied for and recommended by staff, and direct the company to file notice with the commission within 30 days of any changes to the information in the application. Thank you. All in favor? The motion is approved. Mr. Secretary, the administrative agenda. Mr. Chairman, the now the first item on the administrative agenda will be the application of Breaker Box LLC for a license to supply electricity or electric generation services in Maryland. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Kenneth Albert on behalf of staff. Uh, this item addresses a request by Breaker Box LLC for authorization to operate as an electricity broker and aggregator. Yesterday, uh, the company filed to remove residential market. Uh, they indicated to me that that, um, that was a market they weren't really going to focus on, if, uh, if at all, and they just wanted to put it in originally uh, to just check, you know, have the opportunity in the future if they chose that venue, but they chose to uh, remove that. Uh, uh, that was the only change in the application. They are an Exelon affiliate, so they are, needless to say, active in a whole bunch of states. I think we have 18 states plus the District of Columbia. We did check with those states. The complaint status uh, history was satisfactory. We checked as well in Maryland where they have an affiliate. Um, and again, we're, as always, when the complaint number is above a sort of threshold, we get what we call the complaint ratio, where we take that number of complaints over the number of customers. And in, in the instances where there was this kind of substantial number of complaints, the complaint ratio was significantly below 1%. So we felt comfortable that their, their uh, performance was adequate. We would note as a side note, uh, Consumer Affairs Division did alert me that uh, uncharacteristically for the last couple of months, Constellation has not been responding to their queries about complaints that have been filed. So this is a concern that uh, the Consumer Affairs Division has. They indicated this is something that's just occurred recently and it's made it a little more difficult for them in terms of processing complaints. So Mr. Albert, let me stop you there for sure. a, a moment. Do we have counsel for Breaker Box, Exelon, or Constellation present for this item? No, do we know their whereabouts, Mr. Albert? I've been on the phone with them as early as this morning. I got no indication that they would be showing up. Okay. Um, but uh, I did not, yeah. Okay. I, did you have more? Did I interrupt you? No, that's fine. Again, the, the, the bottom line is the, their performance in states, including Maryland, appears to be satisfactory. They are, uh, and um, so therefore the staff does ask the commission to authorize Breaker Box to operate as an electricity broker and aggregator for the commercial industrial market. Okay, thank you. The, the note on Constellation, um, which is an excellent subsidiary, is concerning. Um, Commissioner O'Donnell. Yeah, I wanted to probe these complaints, the nature of these complaints a little bit more. Understand your description of the ratio, but this is not a mathematical process necessarily for me. So um, 35 complaints in 12 months appears to me to be a lot. Um, not, maybe not mathematically, but, um, and, and we have a lot of scrutiny with regard to supplier <laughs> complaints. Do we know the nature of these complaints in Maryland? Uh, we do record it. I did not focus specifically on that. Again, I, one concern, needless to say, is that we're not getting response from the company about them. But no, I, you know, I, would, I did not dig into the precise details, though I have that with me. I have the report from CAD on those if, complaints. If there were 35 complaints that were, or some number of those complaints that were slamming in nature, I would be very concerned about that. And I'd be very concerned about this recommendation, notwithstanding the mathematical uh, argument that you give to us. Um, do you know if any of them were slamming in nature? 
I have the I have the the report with me. Um, one rep, one alleges that the agents misrepresented them as, themselves as the state of Maryland, so that would be a, a concern in terms of you know a misrepresentation. Broker came to my restaurant and says he works for Pepco. Um, so yeah, there are there are allegations in here. Again, we've been sort of handicapped because we have not gotten a response from the utility on these. Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit shocking to me. Exelon has a big presence in this state and its affiliates, and um, I'm very concerned that these affiliates, unregulated affiliates, are um, not being responsive to this commission. That's very concerning to me. I hope that message goes back uh, up the chain of command at the at the Exelon companies. Um, because they should be responsive to this commission, and if they're not, that portends big problems for the future. So thank you for the presentation. I'll support the motion, but uh, it's a little concerning to hear what I'm hearing. Mr. Albert, um, when you say you're not getting a response, you're not getting a response from BreakerBox, Constellation, or Exelon? Um, it's uh, essentially they're affiliated companies. In Maryland, I think it's Constellation. They have a gas and electricity, and they also have a... a uh, I think it's a constellation company. So that's consumer affairs that this is kind of a new, I mean, that to be fair, Exelon has been in the past always responsive, but they said the last couple of months it's made their work difficult because they've just not been getting response from the company. So we get an idea of what's going on with each of these complaints. Well, I, I, I recognize there may be a rogue salesperson or broker every now and again, and I understand that we have a mathematical ratio here but it is concerning, number one, that a representative from um, Breaker Box, Exelon, Constellation did not, not, did not appear today. Um, based on what I have before me, I would still, I am still inclined to, to vote for, for the item, but um, before we move forward, I wanted to see if the commissioners had any questions. Commissioner Richard. Uh, no, no question, but uh, actually now from the uh, discussions you had, the unresponsiveness and the, the fact that, that, you know, there's no, Appearance here today, um, you know, I, I was prepared to, to vote as well. But um, I mean, if, if anyone were to want to hold this over uh, a week or two, I would be certainly uh, open to that. Well, where's Breakbox located? Check that. <clears throat> Did I see Massachusetts? Yes, it's New yeah New Newburyport, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. My colleagues don't disagree. I, I'd like somebody from Breaker Box or Exelon or Constellation to be present to defend their their application here. Um, I see no no disagreement, uh, Mr. Secretary. Let's defer this item uh, for administrative meeting. Let's look at the calendar. Two weeks from today, March the 18th. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Mr. Mosier. Um, Mr. Chairman, items four to six on the administrative agenda consist of the semi-annual Empower uh, Progress reports of BGE, Pepco, Delmarva, Power, uh, Potomac Edison Company, and the Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative. Thank you. If uh, representatives for those utilities and staff, uh, please let's see if we have enough room at the table for all of you. Mr. McCullough, we'll begin with you, then we'll begin with outside parties, and we will have the three utilities respond. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Drew McCullough on behalf of staff. On January 31st, 2020, Southern Maryland, Ele Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative submitted its annual semi-annual progress report for the company's electric vehicle charging program offering 
And on February 3rd, 2020, the Exelon Joint Utilities, BGE, PEPCO, and DPL, and Potomac Edison submitted their progress reports for their semi for their electric vehicle charging program offerings, as directed by Commission Order 88997, issued January 14th, 2019, in Case 9470. <clears throat> the second semi-annual report comprises of the progress of the EV programs from July 1st, 2019, until December 31st, 2019. Smeco's EV pilot was not part of the original petition and was not approved until July 31st, 2019. Therefore, Smeco's EV program was still in the ramp-up phase during this reporting period. Smeco currently has no operational chargers, but has met with local governments regarding potential siting and has launched its EV website. Potomac Edison made its rebate offerings publicly available and launched its EV website on December 31st, 2019. Excuse me, December 13th, 2019. PE has yet to receive any rebate applications. PE has received five applications to host public EV charging stations. Installation of two charges expected in quarter one, 2020. PE has determined that the level two rate will be 16 cents per kilowatt hour, up from its current 14 cents, uh, based on market charging rates, and the DCFC rate will remain the same at 28 cents per kilowatt hour, with no variation in PE's jurisdiction until further notice. <clears throat> the Exelon Utilities EV programs have made the most progress since the first report. Each utility has issued residential rebates. BGE and PEPCO have installed public EV charging stations, while DPL has received multiple applications to do so. Staff does have two concerns with the joint Exelon report. Uh, the data provided by the Exelon utility suggests that residential customers are charging their vehicles during peak hours. Staff recommends that the utilities make a greater, greater effort to educate each customer on the benefits of charging their EV during off-peak hours. Additionally, the Exelon Utilities have asked the Commission to consider allowing the utilities to build public charging stations on utility-owned property. Staff sent the Exelon Utilities a data request to better understand how the siting of EV chargers on utility property would affect the pilot. Staff received responses to this data request late on March 3rd, 2020. Based on the data response, um, it's still unclear what the scope of this proposal is, for example, staff does not know if this would result in a handful of public chargers on utility property or significantly more. Staff notes that the EV pilot program began about six months ago and that the approval process for siting and constructing public chargers on government owned or controlled property may improve as the parties gain experience. Finally, given this lack of clarity, staff proposes that the Exelon Utilities submit a deployment plan in the next semi-annual report or sooner that staff and other parties can react to that includes specific charging locations uh, for chargers on utility property and clear numbers for, on the total number of chargers and ports that would be installed at the utility properties. Staff suggests that the deployment con uh, plan consider where the private market is already supplying charging in these areas. Um, finally, staff recommends Commission note the filing. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. McAuliffe. Um, members of the public, Mr. Hartman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Lanny Hartman. I'm here as an EV driver, and I submitted written comments with some areas of concern. I uh, support this program and really wanted to see it succeed. But um, from an EV driver's point of view, there, there are three areas of concern that I brought up in my written comments. One is uh, an issue that was brought to my attention that one of the charging stations was billing 34 cents per kilowatt hour rather than the 18 cents per kilowatt hour for level two. Um, I had noticed this on the, the Green Lots app for a couple weeks and uh, a friend of mine brought it to my attention and I'd, I've been to hundreds of charging stations and never seen anything quite like this. So I went down there and checked it out for myself and sure enough, I uh, attached the receipt to my comments. Uh, another area of concern was at that same Pepco charging station, there's a sign posted by the city of Tacoma Park that banned taxis and commercial vehicles from using that station. And that's, that sign's been up there for a long time. My concern is uh, in the report, uh, the, the restricting of commercial vehicles may have limited the amount of usage that that charging station would have received during that period of time and therefore the revenue that it could have uh, could have gotten. It's not just uh, banning commercial vehicles, which has happened in some other towns in, in Maryland, but uh, perhaps in the future, if these are being put on municipal properties, they may want to ban plug-in hybrids, for example. And this actually happened in the city of Beverly Hills, California. 
and uh, the public complained and the state legislature actually passed a bill, SB 1000 in 2018, to prohibit that practice at ratepayer and taxpayer funded charging stations. And the other issue is uh, reliability, which is very important to, to me as an EV driver. Um, one of the reasons I support this is because I consider the utilities as very responsive if there is a problem and uh, I experienced a problem at the uh, charging station in Howard County. And I called it in and, and the customer service explained to me that it would take two days for the trouble ticket to reach technical support. And then from that point, it would be uh, put into a queue where it would be uh, dealt with. And I asked several times, are you sure? And, and yes, you were sure, but I got a, an alert later that afternoon that a charging station at that location was back online. I said, perfect, that's exactly what, we're, what, what I was hoping for. I went there and the, char the fast charger was still offline and they were referring to one of the level two chargers for some reason. By this point, <laughs> I'm kind of low on battery. So I experienced for one of the few times in my life what they call range anxiety. Okay, where do I go? I went west a couple miles and just as I was pulling up that to the charging station, the Nissan Leaf was pulling in. Okay, now we had to double down and go the other direction past where it, where it just was and uh, luckily I was able to charge. It was helpful that the charging station that I finally did find was showing its operational status on, the, on their app. Um, so this is a concern. It's something that I personally would like to have more transparency into is what is the expectation of the maintenance and the response time for these fast chargers because that plays into the, the value proposition. It's, it's the, the cost of the charging is not simply to us what the, elect, the delivery of electricity. It's the convenient location. Is there something to do near there? Is it reliable? Is there more than one charger where if one <coughs> is down or occupied or maybe there's a gas car blocking it, do I have other options? And, and we put value on that. And um, I had put a value before learning this, a higher value on the utility chargers because I expected them to be uh, maintained better and a response time that, was, that I'm used to at home when my home electric goes by. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hartman. I suspect the utilities will respond to each of your points from the overcharging to the maintenance uh, protocols. Any other members of the public or Office of People's Council? Seeing none, we'll begin uh, with the B. Let's begin with uh, Smeco. Oh, we don't have a seat for Smeco. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If you want to take the podium there. Um. <clears throat> We're blocked out by the IOUs. I'm sorry about that. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Lisa Rory, I'm the and I'm the manager of DER programs for SMECO and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Succinct and to the point. Um, uh, Potomac Edison. Good morning, Teresa Harold. on behalf of Potomac Edison. I also have with me my colleague, Neil Keating, and we're also here to answer any questions that you have regarding our uh, report. Thank you. And finally, we'll get to the, the Exelon Utilities. Morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Dan Herson on behalf of Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, and I have with me today Christy fleischmann Gronke, who orchestrates our EV Smart program. Thank you. Uh, since Mr. Hartman's questions um, pertain more to, I think, your service territory, would you like to respond to his um, concerns? Yeah, the, uh, one of his, his concerns has to do with this uh, operational question at the uh, Ellicott City facility. First of all, I want to apologize to Mr. Hartman and anybody else that's had that experience at one of our chargers. That's not an acceptable experience, uh, in our opinion. Uh, we did look into this, and we've learned some uh, valuable insight into what happened here. Sorry. 
hear me better now? Okay. Uh, this was a situation where we needed to do a power reset on the charger, and uh, that was not known to us at the time. Since this incident has taken place, we've adjusted the software, the protocol, so that BG is now getting an alert every 15 minutes if a charger is down, it's not operating. And we've also uh, instructed individuals on site that are part of the site hosts, um, either employees or, or representatives, to how, on how to go out and do a simple reset on a power button, something like that. Uh, so if it's if it's a simple fix like that, we don't have to rely on having somebody call the manufacturer and then get it in a queue for, for fixing, that sort of thing. We're also in discussions with Green Lots on how to have a better response to customer inquiries uh, between both Green Lots and the utility. So uh, again, I apologize to Mr. Hartman that he had this experience. I, I think the fixes that we have made will prevent that sort of experience from happening again, but I encourage Mr. Hartman to contact us or any customer that's having a substandard experience and we'll address it. Again, no, not, not making excuses, that we just looked into it and determined what happened here. Uh, this is a pilot program. We're happy to, to have uh, learnings from this, but we don't want them to have a bad customer experience. So we're going we're gonna to do better. Thank you. Well, the, the program is just standing up now. The first, uh, first 12 months, obviously, it's going to take a little while before it's moving up to speed. Um, perhaps this is for Mr. Michael or Mr. Herson. Um, he stated, stated that there was a billing error. He was charged 34, his friend was charged 34 cents over 18 <coughs> cents. Um, what, what's the protocol in those? Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to Rob Stewart who, who handles the program and, and there was a mistake and, and we're working on it. But I'll let, I'll let Mr. Stewart respond. Yes, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, um, this was brought to our attention through the, through the letter. Um, we've been monitoring these chargers since they went live in, in the uh, August timeframe, and they've been billing correctly, it looks like, up until February. Um, so we're working with Green Lots to figure out what happens. We don't know if it was a software update or something that changed the pricing of that charger, but they have been reporting um, correctly and, and building correctly up, up until recently. Um, so we're identifying all the drivers that were involved. They all will receive a credit. Um, for those charges, and, and we, we do apologize for that. We didn't, like I said, didn't know. I, I wish you would, would have contacted us. We could have maybe been on it a little sooner, um, but um, we're, we're, we're having information coming in on a daily basis on getting to the bottom of what exactly the cause was there. Thank you. Well, I would suggest, Mr. Stewart, you trade phone numbers with Mr. Hartman, yes. and it could be a direct connection there. Um, finally, and I, I suspect we have no jurisdiction over the situation. The city of Tacoma Park wants to put signs up to restrict um, who's using the, the facilities. Uh, as an EV owner, I oftentimes recognize that I pull up to chargers and it says no lifts or Ubers, um, and I'm kind of happy because I know sometimes they would hog these facilities um, to the detriment of residential um, uh, private owners. Uh, do you have a position on these signs? Th that's right, Your Honor. Um, I, that was a sign placed by the city of Tacoma Park, and I, I don't think, I mean, we can we, we can go back and talk to Tacoma Park, and it's my understanding that there are chargers available nearby our Tacoma Park uh, location that do accept the Lyft <coughs> and the Uber, Uber drivers, but that was not our decision to put that sign up there. That was a decision made by the by the municipality. Okay. Thank you. I'll open up to questions from commissioners. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. Mr. McKeel, I, um, we received some written comments, I'm not sure if you saw them or not, from a, a Mr. Michael Friedman of Rockville. Yes. And one of the comments, amongst the multiple comments, this is a multifamily condominium. Yep. Um, he says the website does not include information on who to contact for more information. In contrast, the rebate program for the Maryland Energy Administration provides the name of the manager in the program, an email address, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're, we're prepared to respond to that. I'll, I'll again turn to Mr. Stewart, but I will say that uh, we met with her. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a woman. Oh, um, okay. And, okay. and uh, um, but, but we had uh, our individual, Ms. Barbara Gonzalez, go out to their site uh, and meet with their board. And, you know, so we've been in contact uh, with this individual, obviously, you know, it's an initial rollout and we're in the learning phases. And to the extent that she's raised some, some good issues um, and things that we can do better and to improve our website, we will. I'll let uh, Mr. Stewart 
died that, a little yeah, deeper. That's correct. And I, I understand that the, their board did approve the application for that charger. So um, it, it will move forward um, through our, our follow-up as a result of, of her letter. Um, it does bring up some, some bigger questions, and, and we are evaluating the website. You know, we agreed early on through the working group that we would consider a multi-vendor program. Um, and uh, as, as such, we have to be careful that we don't um, lean in one direction or another towards a particular vendor. So in this instance, we probably erred with providing too, too little information at a high level. So we have to figure out what that board level of information needs to be on to educate on each one of the different charger elements and so we are we're working on that and evaluating how we would update the website uh, accordingly how about uh, providing point of contact information manager email yep. address and, and we'll we'll update the website accordingly okay that probably applies across the board to, to all the utilities yes so. sir yes okay um i do have some other questions mr chairman if i might one of our and, I, and i'll just throw this out to the utilities all of them including smeco um one of our senior technical advisors crafted a map for us and it's a, it's a uh, illuminating map uh, because it shows where the low where the chargers are under the pilot and what their density is um, relative density um, and, and it's striking to me being from southern maryland um, of course but the, there's it's almost you can see you can see I-95 in the in the center line of this color chart. Um, I don't see anything much south of Annapolis, or much west of Carroll County, and nothing on the eastern shore. Certainly, Southern Maryland is just getting up and running. I understand that, um, um, but we've had discussions when we authorized the program about the need for geographic diversity. So comment on how that's going where your programs are maybe bg and e northern calvert county for instance talk to me about that uh, we've had a little discussion about that and i'd, I'd also be interested in seeing how smeco uh, thinks its program is rolling out beyond the written comments well, i can start commissioner o'donnell and uh, miss fleischman gronke can fill in details if i miss anything i think when we rolled out the program back in july uh, we saw some initial uh, serious interest from some of the jurisdictions, frankly, that you might expect to see some interest in, where, where maybe you're already going to find a lot of EV owners. So we got a lot of interest right out of the gate from Annapolis, city of Annapolis, Santa Arundel County, uh, Howard County. Uh, some of the other jurisdictions um, have started to express interest. And, you know, currently right now, uh, you know, we're in discussions with every jurisdiction in our service territory about moving forward with deployment of chargers. And uh, I realize the semi-annual report in front of the commission right now is, is just for July through December of last year. But since December, we've had some good progress being made. And you know, looking at the chart that I have here, um, although we still have modest numbers in terms of what's in the ground and operating, uh, it's, looking, it's looking very promising in terms of what we're eventually going to see here. Uh, and really, across our service territory, so I don't feel at this point that there's any particular jurisdiction where we're overly concerned about not being able to place chargers. But um, frankly, the, this process has been a little bit more challenging than we initially thought. Um, <clears throat> as we've approached jurisdictions, they may have uh, permitting or legal concerns. We've had to work through uh, some issues with uh, law offices for the various jurisdictions. Um, Baltimore City, we're working with them to try to get a memorandum of understanding put in place, uh, but they recently had some turnover in their legal department. It's also an election year, so um, we're dealing with some of those challenges. But at this point, I'm not concerned that we're not going to see chargers being put in any particular jurisdiction in our service territory. In terms of the Calvert County uh, chargers that I know are of particular interest uh, to you, Commissioner O'Donnell, um, I, I believe those are going to be cited. There was a question about whether it was uh, Chesapeake City or Calvert County that had to authorize the placement of those. My understanding is that uh, we have addressed things from our side. The ball's in their court. We're waiting to hear back from them on who's going to, to take charge of that. Uh, but you know, once we get that determination, we're ready to move forward with putting those at the ground. 
you might might be surprised the number of commuters into the district or into Andrews, for instance, or other places uh, that are close by. And, and I think the, the wealth level is pretty high there, too, so you would think that there would be a, uh, a need. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think it's for lack of interest. I, mean, I think they're interested. It's just getting through these technicalities and uh, some of the mechanics has been a little bit more challenging than maybe we appreciated at first. Uh, Smeko could comment on how they're being received with their rollout, and then if uh, if uh, Delmarva and Pepco could talk about the dearth of um, deployment uh, in the on the Eastern Shore and in Western Maryland, I'd appreciate that. Sure. So after receiving um, commission approval, we spent much of the fall doing this sort of governmental outreach, and we have met with um, each of the four counties that are in our service territory as well as uh, three of the municipalities. And in general, um, all of the government agencies have been very receptive, um, pretty engaged. And from those meetings, we were able to get a prioritized list mm -hmm. of some sites that internally our engineering department have reviewed. Um, this is, uh, quite frankly, new territory for SMECO, so we didn't even know, you know um, in terms of our distribution system, what it could handle, what upgrades might be needed. And the feedback from our engineering department is that in, in most areas of our service territory, um, our current infrastructure can't support especially level two charging and, and um, quite a bit of level three charging as well. So that was good news to receive. Um, so we've had a high level of engagement um, with uh, a few of the counties in particular, and geographic diversity is certainly at the forefront of our minds, um, especially since charging is generally very um, sparse in, in uh, Southern Maryland. Um, but engagement throughout our service territory. Maybe maybe on the, the, the next semi-annual report, you can give us a sense of, of where you're planning. <coughs> you, uh, so staff noted you had a list. You just said you had a list of potential siting places maybe in the next six, in, over, in the next report, you could give us a sense of that. Sure, absolutely. And Commissioner Adamo, on behalf of Pepco and Delmarva, we've, we've received applications from Capitol Heights, Forest Heights, uh, talked about the Tacoma Park Chargers, Rockville. Um, we're working on some sites with Maryland Department of Transportation, Mount Rainier, uh, Upper Marlboro, Riverdale Park, and we're currently in engineering design for Forest Heights and in construction on Rockville, which will be a, a DC fast charger and a level two. Um, we completed Tacoma Park and then uh, also a New Carrollton site. For Delmarva, we've been received applications from the city of Betterton, uh, from Salisbury, Pocomoke City, and some sites for Maryland Department of Transportation in Cambridge and Stevensonville. Um, we are uh, currently in engineering design for Betterton and Cambridge and Stevensonville. Um, so we're, we're working forward with those sites as well. Okay, very good. Uh, Neil Keating for Potomac Edison. Um, just want to echo, we've seen the same uh, things that you've seen in, in uh, our service territory out in Western Maryland. The, uh, there's not a lot of electric vehicle charging infrastructure out there. Um, we did a, a site-wide or territory-wide study uh, and have determined uh, some, some of the best sites that we feel, for, especially for the DC fast charging infrastructure. Um, so that is uh, something that we're pursuing this year. Um, we have, as you see in the, uh, the filing, uh, received a good interest from some of the uh, municipalities and, and governments out in Western Maryland. Uh, Oakland has applied for a, to host a charger, Grantsville, um, Frostburg has applied. So there's definitely some strong interest that we're, we're seeing out there and uh, we're excited to, to do that. Um, a little update, uh, more around 2020, uh, the Frostburg installation does look like it will be uh, our first and we uh, do intend to break ground here soon, possibly this weekend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Richard. Uh, thank you. Yeah, these were uh, encouraged by these uh, reports today. Uh, I did have uh, just one other question about uh, the, the, the public uh, letters, uh, Ms. Friedman. Um, I, just, I just wanted to find out, are these the type of issues that also that uh, EVIC, ZEVIC, I guess is the right, uh, it should be taking up. And as members of the, the, the ZEVIC, um, both from utilities and, and, and staff and PSC, um, are, are these things that uh, are being addressed or can be addressed? Because I think, you know, particularly in this area where we're trying to encourage multi-unit uh, uh, charging facilities, uh, we hopefully will take these uh, these concerns, these uh, recommendations seriously and, and hopefully come up with, um, I would say, you know, uniform, I, perhaps is the right word, 
uh, recommendations of things we could, might be able to implement. So is, is that something that uh, Zivik and maybe even our work group um, is considering or uh, would, would be able to take up? I would maybe start with staff. Um, well, obviously, if the, if the utilities can come together to find a, uh, a best practice for reaching out to uh, various um, entities, I think that would be great. Um, I think, as we said, this was really the, the first uh, report of the rollout. So I think there's kind of going to be you know, some speed bumps. But if they can reach out to customers through any possible avenues, such as Zvic or you know, online advertising or anything like that, I think that would help. Okay, there is still a Maryland uh, EV website, is that correct? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So, I mean, that would be probably another. Right. No, and, and, and I, again, I'm, I'm encouraged by the reports today. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, that we took, when we get this good feedback mm -hmm. from the public, that we're actually going to act on it, because I thought there were some excellent recommendations there of, of uh, issues that needed to be uh, addressed, and, and hopefully we can do that in, in, in near order. Uh, another issue that was brought up was just um, about again, we, we come up this come before when the utilities have a uh, recommendations or suggestions for changes in a program, how they're vetted, and it sounds like uh, you know again, uh, or, or at least a recommendation or at least a, a point made by Ch ChargePoint is that uh, they would they would like to see it go through either uh, well I think they specifically said go through the work group process, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I would also suggest maybe Zvik as well would be a, a good process so. Uh, you know, again, I think um, I would encourage the utilities. We've, we've we've had a number of things come directly to us uh, at, at the commission in the past. Just speaking as one commissioner, it would be helpful for me to, to know that these ideas, these suggestions, are being vetted by uh, Maryland stakeholders generally. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. I just wanted to, to highlight that one recommendation, that both that came from staff, calling the idea for premature, but also a charge point, suggesting that. If, if these could be pre-vetted, uh, pre-meeting uh, before they come here, that would be, be helpful. Um, and then questions for, for utility too. I was um, noting, you know, I'd like to get your, your input on on how how you think the program is going from the residential standpoint, getting these uh, chargers uh, in people's, the smart chargers, I mean, be specific, into people's homes. I know we have a, a public or a goal of over 3,000 of getting these in, and right now we're talking more in. Uh, the dozens and uh, you know is are, are you satisfied with the rate that these are, are going in are there challenges you're facing at this point trying to get uh, public to to uh, accept the smart chargers and then the other part of the question is how they're being used uh, I took note in the uh, the reports that at this point the, the ones that are being installed the public isn't using the uh, the, 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 the features to, to charge off peaks so um, Anyway, I think managed charging is going to be important. So anyway, I would welcome any uh, utility comments on how that part of the pro program is going. <clears throat> I'll, I'll start off, and, and Christy may want to, to uh, jump in as well. Um, I, I don't see that we're seeing anything um, uh, difficult about the rollout of, of the program and the chargers. I think you know we, we had known that managed charging was an end result that we wanted to demonstrate. Um, and I think each of us have plans as to how we would enable that and communicate that. Uh, I think we can create some communications to customers to ask them to charge off peak, um, whether they can control that through their chargers through the local app or whether they control it through their car. Um, it gives us a data point to see how many customers are willing to do it in advance of a EV only time of use rate, which would encourage them financially to do the same thing. So I think in our overall program design, we all intended to get to that point. Um, to to help manage uh, residential driver behaviors around charging off peak, I think it's early in the program yet, but I think the the comments are well noted, um, and we'll make sure that we can create some uh, baseline communications to uh, to uh, in essence reinforce the benefits of charging off peak for residential customers. And, and I would say we've had some good communications. We had the Washington Auto Show, mm -hmm. and uh, we had. Uh, uh, presence there with our electric vehicles and, and a number of customers came through where we could explain our programs. Um, so we're just getting out there mm -hmm. now. And I think, uh, you know, the auto show was a, a, a real big, uh, you know, draw. And, and we got a lot of folks through where we could talk about our programs and the things we have. And obviously we're, we continue to ramp up. Okay. 
and I'll add on a few comments echoing Mr. Stewart's comments about the financial incentives. So right now there's no incentive for customers to charge off peak. Uh, we have filed the, the tariff pages for the EV only time of use rate, which is tentatively on the um, schedule for March 25th. So once that's in place and customers are incentivized to charge off peak, I, I think there'll be a drastic shift in when customers start charging. Um, right now it would be educational you know, awareness that it would be beneficial to the grid to charge off peak, but they're not, there's no incentive for them to do that at this point. Um, in addition to the volume of rebates, uh, BGE has paid over 150 uh, at this point. Still a little slower than I was anticipating. Um, as noted in the filing, we have several customers on a daily basis purchasing Tesla vehicles and the Tesla wall connector. So when you go online to order your Tesla, the next page is the wall connector, which is not uh, networked or Wi-Fi enabled where we can get the data to provide to um, the commission. So that is one issue that I think is slowing down the number of rebate applications that we're seeing. If you note in the filing, we also compared to MEA where they run out of their rebates quickly, but the Tesla wall connectors are eligible for the rebate. Uh, we've talked to a lot of the charging manufacturers about if they had any ideas on how to inform customers about being able to use the charge point units, the juice box mm -hmm. units, the, the various Wi-Fi enabled uh, chargers on our website. But it, it's just that convenience of their, you know, going through the ordering process and selecting the wall connector. It, it's hard to capture the customer in that process and get them to switch to something Wi-Fi enabled. Uh, Tesla is releasing a Wi-Fi enabled charger, but at this point does not have the back end uh, established to be able to transfer the data to us. Okay. Uh, from Potomac Edison's perspective, uh, we just began our customer education outreach in 2020, uh, and we're encouraged with the numbers we've seen. Um, 14 residential rebate requests and, and 13 off-peak reward, off-bill credit requests. So. Um, there's a lot of interest in folks in, in participating in both programs. Uh, and uh, I have not had the chance to look at the data on our off-peak reward program to see how uh, that's driving the behavior to, to charge off-peak, but that's something we'll be including in the next report. Okay, thanks. And, and Speckle, you, you don't have yeah, a residential Speckle, we're not participating residential program. in the residential. Okay, program. good. All right. Well, you know, again, that maybe this is a, an area where you – collaborate on education or work through ZVIC because I think managed priority charging is going to be very important to the state uh, so we don't uh, undo all the efficiency gains we've made or cause uh, big uh, requirements to upgrade our uh, infrastructure. So uh, again, I think uh, just educating the public and letting them know about these features is uh, I think an important aspect of this program. So, uh, And then the last question, really, how, how are the utilization rates of the utility-owned uh, chargers um, at the report looked like it's pretty low right now, sometimes only less than one one uh, charge a day. Is, is that just because it's early in the program or are there uh, you know other concerns the uh, utilities are uh, tracking and um, is there a, an industry benchmark you know uh, when we look at EVgo and charge point that we should be uh, uh, striving to, to reach as far as utilization of these facilities? I'll start for BGE. So a lot of the, the chargers noted in the uh, semi-annual report were installed pretty close to the end of the year, so there wasn't a lot of data to go off of. Uh, I will note the Annapolis installation. Uh, we have been to that site many times, and it is often blocked by um, gas-powered cars. Uh, so at that site in particular, they had some spaces already designated up front for a couple years as uh, fuel-efficient vehicles and they're right by the door. And we took, per the suggestion of the site host, some of those fuel efficient spots and converted them to EV only um, and with our chargers. But we do see uh, ICE vehicles often parked in those spaces. The uh, rec center has sent out memos to the members of the rec center. We, we also held a town hall to talk to rec center members about the EV charging, but it uh, is often blocked. Um, by non-EV vehicles. We are seeing very uh, high utilization at the Carroll County um, office location. So that was the one that was installed in late December. So the report is pretty low on the number of um, sessions by the end of the year, but 
through today, we've seen almost 70 charging sessions at the Carroll County office. So there's definitely uh, a good number of usage there. We also have seen uh, 20 sessions at the Miller Branch Library, which was commissioned just a few weeks ago. So promising numbers as the network gets out there and customers are able to find and, and use the chargers and know that they're reliable, I, I think they'll continue to increase. Great. <clears throat> and I think similarly, if, as of the filing of this report, we only had the Tacoma Park chargers. Um, I think we, we noted that the, um, in there, the total of uh, uh, 1,900 kilowatt hour consumption between September and December, um, which works out to about 2.66 transactions a day. Um, not, not great, but not, um, not bad either. Um, so I think as we, as we get more chargers out, we'll have a better spread of data to be able to understand what those utilization rates could and should be. Um, and uh, as, as Mr. Mike Heel noted, uh, the Tacoma Park chargers are right across the street from uh, a converted gas station that is also providing DC fast chargers and, and level two charger as well. So um, there's a little bit of immediate competition there um, in Tacoma Park. So um, we would expect as we get more chargers online, we'll have, we'll have better data um, that we can provide. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Herman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, talk to the Exelon Utilities about their request that we consider allowing publicly accessible company-owned property to be eligible for public charging stations. Are you suggesting, are you requesting that we do that here today? Is that your request? I think it was a consideration, a request for a consideration that we be able to do that. Um, I, I think if, if the commission chooses to approve and allow today, um, that would be fine. But I think it was just noted that, that it's an opportunity that we could move forward with pretty quickly if, if that was in agreement with the, with the commission. Okay, and is there any information that's been submitted as to where or what that program would look like, how much it would cost, what the impact on the pilot would be, any of that? No, we, I mean, we, and we could do that. Obviously, we were looking at our, you know, Forestville, Rockville service station, Salisbury, where we have public access to our commercial properties, and we do have, you know, the public coming in for, for doing business. Um, we, you know, don't is, anticipate. Is that access 24-7? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And we don't anticipate more than a dozen chargers total. It was just the opportunity that we could, we wouldn't have to have the long uh, protracted uh, easement discussions and, and agreements to install on our own property. So um, it was just noted that it, that would be an option moving forward. Right. Um, well, I would suggest that to the extent um, uh, you continue to believe that is appropriate, that uh, in a future filing you can you provide Im much more information with respect to that with you know where they would be that there's 24 7 access so on and so forth to the extent um, it is uh, it remains a request uh, in the future so uh, I would uh, for my part I would accept staff's recommendation that we not rule on that uh, at this time because I would it would be my position that the request is to the extent it is an actual request is is not uh, complete. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner yeah. O'Donnell. As a follow-up to that discussion, um, did, did the proposal envision um, potentially using non-regulated affiliates like bg &E Home Products? <coughs> uh, I, do I we know? No, I don't believe so. I think it was just our company properties. And it didn't, I, I know there were some questions and data requests about whether we would acquire new property. No, the answer to that was, was all no. It was just our existing facilities where we have the ability to access to the public to access uh, without having to come inside a secure perimeter. Um, we could install some chargers was, was really uh, about as far as that um, so if, co if concept had gone. Fair enough. If the if the proposal does remain viable, when you do come back with a future filing proposal, you may want to circumscribe in the where we're going to put these things to maybe your regulated rate based properties instead of that, some that other was the place. Yes, sir. Thank you. I agree with those comments. Uh, obviously, data request was just filed yesterday, so um, I'd be interested to see a filing in the future. Um, that said, I only have one question, and it's for the folks at the table, um, since you're ahead of both your colleague utilities. 
Do your utilities, PHI or BG, know which of your customers have electric vehicles in their homes? Because I'm asking this because the we're starting out rel relatively slow with the, the rebates. So if Pepco would send me direct tailored mail, Jason Stanek, would you like to apply for this? Because we know you have an EV. Do you have that information? Uh, I think I'll I'll start uh, for the Pepco companies. We do not. Um, have you tried to get that information? <laughs> We've tried through the Maryland Department of uh, Motor Vehicles, and we looked at some registration data and went down that path for a while, but the data was fairly erroneous. Um, so we had some trouble, and it's zip code level data, not address level data. So um, it's really hard for us, and, and we're limited with the DMV data because we can't market based on the data. So we could even if we could figure out who... Oh, just to be clear, just to be clear, MVA will not provide... EV owner data to the utilities, and you've, they, a, you've asked. They, they did. Um, the problem was we had to actually, there was some errors as to whether they were plug-in hybrid vehicles or whether they were plug-in vehicles or whether they were just hybrid vehicles. So we had to search by VIN number every every vehicle that was in there. And when did you last inquire? Uh, I, I don't know the time frame. It you might want to do it again because they have very detailed information on okay. what's a plug-in and what's a battery electric vehicle. Um, and they, they know who owns what in the okay. state, and we're up to 30,000. So that may be one avenue to pursue because you'll be directly targeting those customers with that $300 rebate. And, um, and we would need to re-inquire as to whether we would be allowed to market based on that data because it, that was a big uh, stopping point for us. Now. Well, I, I would encourage you to have those conversations with the MVA administrator and then report back in the next six-month period. Okay. Ms. Scrunky. Yeah, I have a different response. So BGE does have a self-report um, form on our website, so we know about uh, 6,000 EV drivers in our territory. So, And it, it's a process through our rebate application. We ask them to self-report um, their car and their address. So there's a form that they fill out just telling us uh, their account number and what car they purchased, and we record that in our billing system. So we have been directly marketing to those 6,000 customers. We also built a propensity model off of those 6,000 customers. So we took the features of their accounts and then built a lookalike um, for 100,000 customers and have been directly marketing to those customers as well. Good. Direct marketing, I think, works. So perhaps Pepco could, uh, PHI could look into that. That was my only and question. Mr. Chairman, just as follow up, we, we did just complete a pilot of about 300,000 customers using AMI data where we could go back and screen the AMI data and we're reviewing those results now to see if we can accurately determine who has EVs uh, based on that data as well. So we're, we're, we're currently working. Very good. Um, Mr. Hoover, I saw you stand up. Did you have something to add to this? Just one follow-up. Um, previously, the Maryland General Assembly actually passed the law that gave the utilities the geographic location of where the cars were because there was a concern prior about too many cars in, in one location. But it strikes me that this is a situation there, Commissioner uh, Richard's suggestion about using EVIC is the proper venue to sort of deal with this issue about how to market directly and interface with the Motor Vehicle Administration since EVIC is run through the Department of Transportation and also has members on there from the Maryland Association of Counties and the Maryland Municipal League. So all these issues related to these siting concerns might actually be resolved by running some of these issues through that organization. Mr. Hoover, that is an excellent point. The utility should be working through through ZVIC because you have MDOT there, you have MVA there. Pull them aside, ask them the question, report back to us in six months. One follow-up from Commissioner O'Donnell, and then we will take a motion. So these are great discussions. Um, who administers, does anybody know who, who in the state administers the state's tax rebate program for purchasing an electric vehicle? I believe it's Office of the Comptroller. Comptroller? So, so there may be another potential source. Who has gotten the, the tax cut, therefore you know who has got an electric vehicle? I was very happy to receive in the mail a check signed by Peter Francho for my rebate recently, so yes. Uh, it took a while, but it's worth the wait. A very good point, Commissioner O'Donnell. Yet another office that has access to information regarding who has at least applied for an excise tax rebate. Thanks. I, I think as the commissioners echoed, we're, we're off to a, a, a slow but, but steady and good start. So thank you. With that, I'll call a motion. Mr. Chairman, for items numbers 
four, five, and six, I move the commission note the filings. All in favor? Aye. The motions are approved. Mr. Chairman, item number seven is the decommissioning plan of Bluegrass Solar LLC for its CPCN under case number 9496. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This is Chris Flo on behalf of staff. This item adjusts the request by Bluegrass Solar LLC for the approval of its decommissioning plan filed on January 10, 2020. In November of 2018, Bluegrass Solar requested a CPCN in case number 9496 to construct an 80 megawatt solar generating facility located in Queen Anne's County, Maryland. On September 26, 2019, the company's request was granted by the commission along with several licensing conditions proposed by the Department of Natural Resources Power Plant Research Program, PBRP. Pursuant to PBRP's licensing condition number 33, Bluegrass Solar is required to file for commission approval for a decommissioning plan along with a financial instrument to, that would cover the estimated decommissioning costs. In the filing, the company describes the approach to conduct the decommissioning activities for removal of facilities and equipment associated with the project after its useful life. The plan also includes the provisions for removal of all structures, foundations, restoration of soil and vegetation following the end of the project's useful life. The company also intends to implement a surety bond or a letter of credits to ensure that the decommissioning costs are not borne by the state or the county. After a review, staff believes that the plan meets the requirements of the licensing condition number 33, and staff recommends that the commission approve Bluegrass Solar's decommissioning plan filed on January 10, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. Uh, does Council for Bluegrass Solar have anything to add? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. James McGee representing Bluegrass Solar. Uh, we don't have anything to add, but we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Do commissioners have questions? Is there a motion? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, Mr. Chairman. For uh, item number seven, I move we approve the company's decommissioning plan. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. The motion is approved. Mr. McGee, just 12 copies in the future, not 17. That's progress. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, item number eight is a request uh, for a waiver of the Community Solar Pilot Program operational deadline for P52ES. 1755 Henryton Road, Phase 1 LLC's project in Howard County. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, at Necropol, on behalf of the Commission staff. Uh, P52 ES 1775 Henryton Road, Phase 1 LLC is seeking a waiver of the operational deadline established under Comar 20 620304C. Uh, which waiver would extend the deadline for constructing its community solar system from February 1, 2020 to October 31, 2020, approximately 10 months beyond the 18-month operational deadline under COMAR. As good cause, which is required under COMAR 2062-0104 for the granting of this waiver, applicant notes that there have been various delays in the local permitting process and P52ES does not expect to receive all permits required to begin construction until March of this year. Due, due to the experience of delay to date, applicant has built in some additional time to its waiver request beyond the predicted time for receiving the permits and the four months for construction. This is applicant's first request for a waiver and it's possible that this additional time would be required. Staff recommends a time limited waiver of Comar 2062-0304C through October 31, 2020. Thank you, Ms. Garofalo. Council for P52ES. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. David Bugleman is on behalf of P52ES 1175 Henryton Road, Phase 1 LLC. I have with me Sean Reaney, the uh, Senior Project Manager from Nautilus Solar. Um, he can answer any questions the Commission may have about the permitting for this project. Um, but obviously, the project supports uh, staff's recommendation to adjust the operational deadline to October 31st, 2020 is excited to bring additional two megawatts of uh, LMI capacity online in, in the uh, program. Thank um, you. Again, we're happy to answer any questions. Mr. Vigelmans, are you still ready to go in March? So my understanding is, uh, Your Honor, the, the expectation had been um, if everything went according to plan is to receive uh, building and electrical permits by March. It's actually slipped 
um, a month. Now they're expecting April, and I could slip further. They haven't received those permits. Again, that's why we've, we've baked in some additional um, time to allow for some flexibility there. Again, the project you know, has already ordered the panels um, to begin construction. They want to move forward. They're just trying to finish up the last um, few steps here. Okay, so that's being pushed back a month, but you're not asking for more time in your request? No, no you're wrong. Okay, thank you. Uh, commissioners. Commissioner Donnell. P-52 ES, Mr. Bugelman, so we've seen that company here before, haven't we, with a co-location issue, or if memory serves me right? I, I believe that's, um, well, it's, so uh, Power 52, I, I believe, Your Honor, has been here. I, I, don't, I don't represent Power uh, 52. Um, this project uh, was acquired by Nautilus Solar, um, so I think it was originated by Power 52, and I think they may be on board for um, some construction-type activities and, and uh, job training, but... Um, this is a request the parent to Nautilus Solar here. Does the staff know if this is related to the co-location issue? Did that come up? Um, there, there has been such an issue. I, I would have to check to see if this was the exact property. Okay. Well, uh, I thank you. I, w I will note the weather this winter. Mr. Bugelman's has been very good. There should have been no winter construction <laughs> delays on any of these projects. Any additional questions? Seeing none, is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move that we grant P52ES 1775 Henryton Road Phase 1 LLC a time limited waiver of Comar 2062-0304C through October 31st, 2020. All in favor? The motion is approved. Mr. Chairman, item number nine is a notification of transfer of operating company from Lori Roberts, care of Historical Old Town Bridge Preservation, LLC. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Lloyd Spivak for the Commission staff. This is a filing by the owner of the Old Town Toll Bridge notifying the Commission that the operation of the bridge is being transferred from OIC, LLC to Historical Infrastructure Management, LLC. Under Public Utilities Article Section 6-101 and 5-203, prior commission approval is required for the transfer of stock or other ownership interest in a public service company. However, this requirement does not apply to LLC membership interests because the statutory provisions predate the creation of LLCs as a corporate form and have not been modified. In this instance, both of the management companies are LLCs and neither in and of itself is a public service company. Ownership of the bridge is not changing, and OIC, LLC, and Historical Informa Infrastructure Management, LLC, have the same principal, that is Ms. Lori Roberts, the owner of the bridge. Uh, Ms. Roberts has advised staff the principal reason for the change in management company is to domicile the management company in West Virginia, where she resides, primarily for tax purposes. Staff recommends that the commission note the transfer of the management of Old Town Br Toll Bridge from OIC LLC to Historical Infrastructure Management LLC. Thank you. Is there a representative for the toll bridge here? Seeing none, uh, are there qu questions? Commissioner O'Donnell. A couple quick questions. Um, this is this is extraordinary. I didn't realize we regulated toll bridges. So I wanted to ask, did, did you uh, find out what a low water toll bridge is? Uh, yes, yes, Commissioner, actually. Um, if you've never seen the bridge, uh, it's a bridge that is that actually is very low to the water at normal levels, and it's designed to have floodwaters flow over it um, rather than uh, be way above the water as most bridges are. That's what I, I assumed that's what it was, but I wanted to ask to make sure just so I know going forward. And then, two, how are the rates regulated, or are they regulated at all? We regulate the rates. We regulate the rates. We, we have occasional rate cases from the toll bridge. Interesting. Um, they are actually the only only bridge we do regulate. Most of the bridges in the state are publicly owned, uh, but a privately owned toll bridge would be subject to the commission's jurisdiction. I'd love to sit on a rate case for a toll bridge. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you may have your opportunity soon. Uh, Ms. Roberts has uh, kind of intimated that one may be coming. And I could tell you, looking at a photograph, passenger cars are $1.50. Um, there's the toll booth. Any other questions? Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, excuse me. Uh, I move for item number nine that the commission note the transfer of management from Old Town Toll Bridge from OIC LLC to Historical Infrastructure Management LLC. All in favor? Aye. Motion's approved. 
Mr. Chairman, item number 10 is a request from BGE for a waiver of a CPCN requirement to modify an existing overhead transmission line in Baltimore and Hartford <laughs> counties. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, Lloyd Spivak for the Commission staff. This is a continuation of last week's uh, discussion of this item. Uh, since last week's discussion, uh, BGE has filed a letter uh, indicating that uh, they will ensure that cell phone service is not interrupted during the construction. I believe OPC has filed reply comments. Um, but beyond that, the issue is ripe for the Commission's consideration. Thank you, Mr. Spivak. Council for Office of People's Council. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm not going to repeat what's in the letter. I'm just going to make four or five points. Just One four or five. We have read the letter. Yes. Yes, I know. Okay. Yep. The first thing is, is that this is a competitive uh, market efficiency um, it's basically a coincidence that BGE has, the, has won the project for it. Um, two, there is no allocation info as to which zone will be paying what, and that has not been provided to the commission. Um, the third thing is, um, uh, 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 um, Commissioner O'Donnell, you were troubled by a statute that said shall and that you want to honor the legislation's, legislature's intent. Um, but in terms of statutory interpretation, um, Maryland appellate courts have often held that the word shall, the word shall can mean may. And um, uh, for example, um, Hitchens versus City of Cumberland, 215 Maryland, 315, 323. Um, the legislative use of the word may or shall does not in itself control judicial construction of the relevant statute as permissive or mandatory. Now, that goes along with something else. It doesn't automatically mean that shall can be interpreted as may but one is instructed by the courts to look at the legislative history. I don't believe from reading any of the filings that either BGE or staff has provided you with any legislative history about this section. I came closest because I think in 1993 there was a, a, there was a, a limit of 90 days and that was taken out of the statute and courts often draw an inference when something is taken out, that 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 is a legislative intent. Um, can I respond, Mr. Alexander? Can I respond to that point before you go on? Well, you know, I, had, I, but, I, I would argue, from a, as a former member of the legislature, that that the legislature views shall as will, and notwithstanding what the courts say, that's why there's a healthy tension between the two co-equal, I would remind you, co-equal branches of government in the state. So I don't believe that the court's findings are necessarily dispositive on legislative intent. Well, they are, unless the legislature overturns a case, they are binding on the legislature. But I would say something more about that point. And I, and I have participated in overturning judicial rulings yeah. in the legislature. Yes, and it can do that, but in here, there have been many cases where shall has been interpreted um, as permissive and the legislature has rarely, as you say, there's one um, or two instances, but generally these cases are upheld and a as a general rule. Now again, I'm, I'm not saying that it, it, it has to be permissive I'm simply saying that one would need, based on the courts, to determine its context and look at the legislative history, and no one has provided this commission with the legislative history. I appreciate that, history. Mr. Alexander. Thank you. I, I would say that your argument says shall means nothing. Why don't we move on to your next argument? We've, we've heard that one. <laughs> I realize this is like the myth of Sisyphus, Your Honor. I am going up a hill that I can never go up because the 
the uh, ball rolls down again. I understand that. Um, well, it depends on your strength, Mr. Alexander, well, and the I'm, strength of your arguments. I'm trying. Keep pushing. Uh, this is an economic rather than a reliability project. If the forecasted investment doesn't pan out, investors lose, but BGE is made whole through the formula, the FERC formula rate, because they have an abandonment guarantee in their formula rate, and that is BGE will bill ratepayers BGE's prudently incurred abandonment cost if Project 5E is abandoned or canceled for reasons beyond BGE's control. So, uh, Mr. Alexander, we've seen that story before play out, but isn't that a FERC matter, not a PSC matter? Um, it, it, At this early stage? Yes, yes and no. And, and the sense is that if it's going to be the, the prudence is decided, that's FERC. If it goes into the rate base, if this is approved by the commission, that's FERC too, understood. But the point is, is they win, BGE wins either way, and the ratepayers do not. You, you just conceded that both prongs are properly before FERC. No, when you say um, prongs, you were, the prudency review, the rate recovery is determined by FERC. Yes, but that's not. That's uh, maybe, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on my point. Because of that guarantee, if it's canceled for some reason, it doesn't have to be imprudent beyond uh, um, uh, the control of BGE. BGE, because of that guaranteed rate, gets to put everything that they have put in into the formula rate, put it in rate base, and charge rate payers. So it's a, it's a, it's not you're going to it. This is this is FERC's. This is FERC's decision. It's not yours. Okay. I, I think that was the point that I'm, I'm making. This is a, a FERC decision, not the PSC decision yeah. under 7207B. I'm talking about the result. That's all I'm talking about. The result is, is that... Are you arguing that the commission should consider that result in a 7207B proceeding? Well, I was going to do... Um, one more thing, and then c if I can, just say one brief thing and then get to your question. Um, the other thing is, is that because this is economic, no one will be able to tell if and when the promised economic benefits are realized. That includes ratepayers, PJM, and BGE. So in answer to your question, um, I have stated previously, and I know Commission Madonna disagrees with me that I think that shall can, can be construed as permissive with the legislative history considered. And I would say, without being able to point to the legislative history, because I wanted to look it up, but this got pressured, this was, this was meant, in my view, for small little projects who didn't want, who, who the legislature didn't want to have to go through the process. If it's permissive, then yes, you have all the rights. The commission has all the rights to guide it. If it is shall, you don't. It's your interpretation of the statute that guides this. And I would say that also competitively bid projects were, is only a recent phenomenon with Transource being the first one in PJM, and this law did not contemplate, because it couldn't, because it didn't have anything before it. This is recent phenomena from 2014. The law goes back 30, 40 years. So all I'm saying is is that this is a gamble for rate the way if, if shall is interpreted as mandatory, not permissive in any circumstance, where the investors, the ratepayers, can't leave the table. If they're in BGE territory, they can't walk away from the game, and no one can ever tell them if this is paid off or not. And I think $50 million for the BGE ratepayers is worthy of some aspect of const statutory construction. Had, so, had this application been made under 7207E, I would agree with you, but we, we're operating under a different provision here. 
Um, Mr. Alexander, do you have additional arguments? No, Your Honor, I told you it would be it would be short. You always like that, and I'm trying to live up to it. And you are a man of your word, and I appreciate that, Mr. Alexander. Mr. Ralph, do you have anything to add? Uh, no. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Th thank you. Uh, do commissioners have any questions? Commissioner Richard. Uh, sure. Um, I think we, we've covered everything uh, you know today, and then and the last. But just just again to to reemphasize that that what we're hearing today is. Uh, while this is a you know, waiver for a certificate of public convenient necessity, and it's about necessity, this commission, you know, since this law came into effect, really has no longer any jurisdiction over determining that necessity. Is, is that correct for, for staff? Is that? Uh, I think staff is yeah. really of the opinion that shall and mandatory. Mm -hmm. okay. Shall and mandatory. Uh, do mean exactly what they say in this instance. And I also would note, actually, with respect to the legislative history of this, uh, I do recall that the current mandatory waiver came about because there were a substantial number of cases for projects that now fit within this category mm -hmm. that the Commission actually did have to put through a CPCN process. And BGE, um, and the other utilities were not happy about having to go through a full CPCN projects for what they viewed as being relatively modest pro and small projects that really didn't merit that. And they went to the legislature, and I think with the commission's um, acquiescence, at least, got that change made. Okay. But, but things have changed now. We have this concept of the market efficiency projects and uh, we, we looked, is that correct, to uh, PJM and the larger RTEP process uh, to, to make that determination now as to you know, what is necessary or not. That is correct. Okay. So, so for, I guess, for BGE, um, the necessity of this project, as we discussed last time, is it's a, it's a portfolio of projects, which, you know, the, the 5E, but there are also two other projects upstream in Pennsylvania uh, that, that also will determine whether this meets the necessity, you know, by PJM, uh, whether or not this project uh, it would, would be approved, I guess, in the RTEP process. Is that correct? I mean, there is a, there is a sequence. In well, as I recall, um, PJM didn't uh, put it in a particular order in terms of uh, requiring that, uh, for example, Hunterstown Lincoln go before uh, the 5E pro uh, project. Right. So you, so you look at the, you look at the the whole RTEP yes. process, yes. but do you already already assuming that that the HL and the uh, 9A alternative uh, are it exists? Is that correct? So that that's what goes into your uh, assumption. Not not even assumption. Basically, your right to move forward with 5E, um, because as far as you're concerned, there they exist by fiat of, of PJM, and, and so therefore BGE can move forward whenever it wants to and get, and get recovery. Well, I, I would say it this way. There is a problem, and 5E is meant to address that problem, and PJM has tried to address that problem by directing the construction of 5E. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is a congestion problem. Whether it's right. Hunterstown Lincoln or 9A, there is a problem, and it's going to affect Maryland customers. So that's what 5E. 5E is a Maryland um, project to, to uh, okay. basically address a Maryland problem. But the flow is the congestion is on the Maryland side, okay? And so if the projects north of Maryland in Pennsylvania aren't addressed, then having this super highway of sorts, 5E, doesn't make sense if there's a dirt road that moves that, that, that flows into this super highway. So there, there, there is a problem in Maryland. It will be more of a problem once that flow flows down. Okay. And then final question. I mean, without the HL and the 9A alternative, would, would this 5A all by itself, 5E, sorry, by itself uh, meet the requirement, the necessity requirement for a market efficiency program uh, as, as specified by PJM? So my understanding from PJM is that despite the BC ratio of 5E being what it is without those projects, that they have continued to improve and continue
continue to want BG to uh, develop a project because it is anticipated that whether it's 9A, again, or one of these other projects, it will uh, be an issue in Maryland more than it is now. Okay. But so it, it, there, the, the 1.25 BC ratio is a rule except when DGM just decides it's not the rule? I don't know that they've ever um, indicated it was a rule. I think that's their um, – that's a line where they have, as I think was the testimony in another case, more discussion and more analysis. Okay. Well, it, it is sort of troubling. I mean, uh, I, I, I think it is clear, at least to me, that uh, we don't really have any say in this and, and that this – at this point, I, I mean, it's disappointing that BG, for me anyway, I'm just speaking for myself, is, is proceeding in this manner because it, it seems like it would be prudent and be in the best interest of Maryland ratepayers if we actually see what happens with these other two projects. You know, does Pennsylvania actually act on the HL and does the, uh, the 9A alternative get put into place? Because then we could have some certainty, at least some assurance that, yes, the BC ratio is such that for this market efficiency program, not a reliability project, market efficiency project, it really would be in the benefit of Maryland customers. And, and it seems like if we just waited another, you know, 30 days or so, and if BGE weren't rushing to get this through um, so that they can lock in that uh, recovery, um, that would be in the best interest, at least in my view, of the Maryland ratepayers. But uh, giving the, the law is what it is, um, you know, I, I will uh, – well, I, I, it's my, my job to support the law and support uh, this, this request for a waiver. So, no more. May I have just one more comment, Your Honor, just to respond? <laughs> okay, one, one brief – I mean, it's not going to change the result, but I think it's – Don't, don't prejudge the result, um, okay. Mr. Alexander, but w what's your comment? The comment is that I think um, uh, Mr. Ralph misspoke a little. Uh, Mr. Hurling has testified that 9A, that 5B is built on 9A. I don't want to discuss the other proceeding in this well, context. Well, it's in, it's in all the RTEP. Yeah, and I don't want to discuss Mr. Hurling's testimony. Uh, okay, yeah. if we move aside from that right now, 5E is 1.1. That's it. And so, therefore, we're just talking about money and whether ratepayers – there's no question there's congestion. But the thing is, if ratepayers are going to not get a benefit but pay more than the congestion, a return of and on over 15 years, that doesn't seem fair. Now, I understand. Mr. Alexander, I think you've made this argument I did. before. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner O'Donnell. Just a quick question. Um, to thank the company for solving my concern from last week, which was not the legal question concern. Uh, it was a public safety concern. I am of the belief that our uh, broader statutory authority here at the commission um, uh, to protect public safety um, in, in all things we do trumps legal arguments in a uh, subordinate portion of the what I believe is a statutory construct. So very quickly, you reassured us that public safety would be protected by maintaining emergency communications for some of the customers who would be affected, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, we do. Thank you. With that, is there a motion? Uh, yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pursuant to uh, Public Utility Article 7-207B41, the Commission finds that BGE has met the requirements for the mandatory waiver of the requirements to obtain a CPCN and grants the company's request. The Commission makes no finding or determination the project in question is prudent or necessary. The Commission also takes note that the company has committed to all the conditions recommended by PPRP in case number 9323 and to the request seeking assurance of cell tower coverage during construction. All in favor? The motion is approved. Good day.